record. Good afternoon, everybody. And I just want to thank all of you who are attending the 2015 first annual International Virtual Fantasy Con. And I'd like to say that we are going to do another edition of The Price of Magic and how to make it a believable system. It seems to be a very popular topic with our authors. So we're just going to go there again today. Uh, my name is Denise Guru, and I am one of the creators of Virtual Fantasy Con. And uh, I am also a paranormal fantasy uh, author, and my latest release is Candlelight and Cobwebs. Um, so what I'd like to do is just go around, and we'll start at the top, and let all of our authors that I'm very thankful got the time to join us today, uh, let them introduce themselves and tell us where they're from, a little bit about themselves, and what their latest project is. So I guess since Jonathan is up at the top, on my screen anyways, we'll start with Jonathan. Sure. My name's Jonathan Yanez, and I live in Orange County, California. And I started writing... Um, young adult fantasy but that kind of evolved with some of the, like the topics i wanted to explore in characters so it became new adult and i've even written some adult but it's all pretty much stayed um fantasy paranormal supernatural and then i try to write as much as i can each day so i'm working on side projects that are like steampunk here or science fiction there but the book the series of books that uh, incorporate the magic are called the nephilim chronicles so they incorporate kind of like angels and demons and that sort of thing. And I read his, one of his books, and I tell you, I really liked it. He's a really good writer. <laughs> so, all Thank right. Thank you. So let's go on to Ari. And we know she is our international girl. So take it away, dear. Hi, I'm Ari Farnham. And I'm in the Czech Republic right now. And uh, I write, uh, basically, what, the series that I've written that has uh, fantasy in it is a cross between urban fantasy and uh, a contemporary dystopia. So it's set in the modern world, uh, a world that on the surface looks pretty much identical to this one, and uh, historical events aren't changed. Uh, however, there is clandestine or secret magic in it. So there was a specific challenge to make it believable that the magic could exist and yet nobody would know about it. Um, and that's called the Kiranai series. The first book is called The Soul and the Sea. And uh, I'm, I'm starting at this point. That's, that's basically an adult urban fantasy dystopia type of uh, story. And uh, I'm starting... Uh, mid-grade uh, series of mid-grade uh, children's books for children from earth-centered uh, or pagan families. But that is not, that's more, more in the contemporary world and doesn't necessarily have to do with the kind of fantasy magic we're talking about, although there is an element of magic in there as well. Okay, thank you, Ari. And it's Justine's turn. Hello, I'm Justine Manzano. I write contemporary young adult fantasy. Um, and uh, I should have said I'm from New York City. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on something kind of similar to Ari's where it's, it's magic operating uh, in the shadows, um, hidden from the world. And so um, that, that's, that will be released, The Order of the Key. It's going to be released in 2016. Um, early in the year, and it's my first novel, and it will be the first of a series of six. Well, great. Congratulations on your first novel. <laughs> All right, Thank Auden, you. it's your turn. Well, hi, I'm Auden Johnson, and I'm also in New York. I'm in Brooklyn, and um, I write mostly dark fantasy, so it's a mixture between horror and fantasy. And I've written a couple of books, and they all have magic in them because I just find giving my characters magic so much fun. 
And the biggest magic system I created was for my novel, my series, my Merging World series. And that took me years to create, but I'm really proud of it because it's just, it's a, it was a lot of fun to create. Great. You know, and I think that's probably one of the main reasons that I like to write in the fantasy uh, uh, genre. It's because I like to live in the worlds that I create. You know, it's when I'm writing about magic, I feel like I'm there, you know, and um, I've been, this the first book, my Dragon Horse series, it took me eight years to write the first book because I was, uh, practicing and studying earth-based religions and taking any workshop, any class I possibly could that had to do anything with magic, you know, uh, herbs and, and crystals and pendulums and, and, and all of that. And when I was taking all these classes, I didn't really, really uh, understand that I was actually grooming myself to write these books. And uh, so I think that probably leads us into our first question is um you know when you're writing your books and you're trying to make a believable system how does that work with each of you i mean what where does that fall into place for each of you why did you choose um the magic that you chose i mean if you chose a culture of magic you know some of us do norse you know jonathan jonathan said he he's wrote about the nephilims i mean was there an interest there is there something about you that chose you know that culture and uh uh was it important to you that it came across believable so does that make any sense to anybody <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Are we taking turns or are we just like jumping in whenever we have something to say? Well, I think if somebody's ready to go, uh, go right ahead, Jonathan. We can just keep going right on okay, down. Okay, I'll go. Okay. Sure. So I think I was attracted to the angels and demons and the story of the Nephilim because I hadn't read a, a really like, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm sure some authors written an amazing novel about angels and demons on earth but I just hadn't read it yet. So I wanted to read that story. So I, I try to write as a rule what I would want to read. And that makes it um, really interesting and a fun experience for me to, to write. So I chose the Angels and Demons and I really like Marvel movies and superheroes. So really quick, the Angels and Demons um, are choosing people on earth, humans on earth, and those are called Nephilim. And they are giving these people special unique powers to kind of wage this war on earth for the angels and demons because the angels and demons won't, they have kind of like a cold war going on. They won't interact and like conflict each other like hands on. So they're using kind of like as a chess game, these humans to move forward their agenda. So yes, I don't know if that answers the question. Kind of get ahead of myself. I get excited when I talk about writing. <laughs> Well, I, I agree with you, though. I think sometimes it's, it is. It's like we we choose to write what we want to read or because we've read something and we think that, oh, I, I, I can do that a little bit better. <laughs> okay. And I'm saying I'm sure there's like some amazing, you guys might know of like amazing angels and demon stories out there. So I'm not saying they don't exist, but I just hadn't found one yet. Well, I don't, you know, I read yours, Jonathan. And what what Ari? I was just saying it sounds like an, a, a fascinating premise. It's 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 got my interest peaked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, who's next? Is Ari? You want to take that or Justine or who's ready? Sure, I'll, I'll pick it up. Okay, go ahead. Um. Yeah, my original idea was was similar in that. I hadn't seen a book that was specifically uh, about the kind of issues and the kind of magic that I was interested in. I came from international journalism. I spent uh, a lot of years traveling around in small conflict zones in places like Kosovo and things like that. And so I was very interested and aware of international politics and the weird things that go on in international politics. And I've always been also some, uh, interested in observing people's behavior and how people interrelate. 
And so the idea originally came from, there are some weird things about the way people relate from small children. I now have preschoolers and I have to tell you, the way that small children relate is weird. And it has a lot of parallels to, the, to how international corporations relate. Not all of them good. <laughs> and um, so basically my idea was, what if you could explain the somewhat irrational and often self-destructive ways that people behave, at, whether it's with high school cliques or uh, with international politics, um, by there being something under the surface that caused people to have a strong desire to go in a certain direction, even if it was to their own detriment. And uh, so this went out in different directions. I also was very interested. I wasn't so much a specific culture as I was a very strong Tolkien fan as a, as a young adult. And uh, that's always stayed with me. I haven't read it in quite a while, but um, I have read everything, including things like the Silmarillion um, several times. And so I wanted to explore the ideas in a different way. So I included elements of high fantasy and a non-human race in the history of the world, because one of the other things that occurred to me was why aren't there other species that are similar to humans when there's all kinds of subspecies of dogs or monkeys or whatever, you know, why isn't there a subspecies closer to humans? So to me, and also I look at many international um, cultures where there's legends about certain types of people that are different, such as people with pointed ears in all these different countries that are very geographically diverse. So I said, okay, why, did, why are all those legends there? Because they really existed once. Why are they gone? You know, so then you, you have to go and follow those what if questions. So mine started not from a particular um, culture or a particular idea of I want to explore a certain type of magic, but more following what if questions and their logical consequences. Yeah, I took a similar um, direction where it was mainly um, uh, me trying to explore power struggles and power balances. And so I have a um, sort of a three rung power system where there are keys who have access to much more power and then guardians who have sort of sub powers of those keys. And then the regular human mortal people who don't have access to any of that and how that balances and what kind of people that makes, that, that creates. Because you have people in, in this power structure who have these overwhelming abilities and you can get good people who will use those in a responsible manner. And then you can get people who are really power thirsty and there really is no selection process. It just, whoever lands with it and what kind of person you get. And also sometimes that power creates something in a person that may not have been there. Um, had they not had access to it, like mind control or uh, a fire element, the ability to burn down the world around you. I mean, that having that level of power, that could be something that normally you'd be very kind and, and gentle, and, but, you know, no one can mess with you if you can burn down the world around you, and it gives you a sort of sense of, of power that you wouldn't have before. Um, but mainly the idea was to, it was, it was torn between that, that analysis of what power can do to people and how power balances um, uh, among people can cause problems in interpersonal relationships. But mainly it was an idea as far as the core of, of my main character to see what a person who's always wanted to have a more powerful, um, and a more interesting life what happens to her when she gets it and sees that maybe it's not everything that she desired, that it causes more harm in her life than good in a lot of ways. And just kind of take that and run with it and see where she went. Well, so I've always been fascinated by darkness. It's probably from my horror background because I came into fantasy through horror. But anyway, I've always been sort of, I just found darkness so fascinating. And while I was doing research for my story, I came across Carl Jung's concept of the shadow. And it says that there, there is this untapped energy in darkness. And that sort of has something click for me. So I sort of started thinking like, 
there's this energy in darkness and my story sort of unfolded from that, that I created these characters who can pull energy from darkness and they pull, they pour it inside themselves and they can use their bodies to shape it, to create like shields or protection or swords or even, uh, or even to clear out sort of any sort of um, impurities in some food or cheese or something. And then the, the magic system just kept getting bigger and then the energy in darkness became alive and something that has a mind, a consciousness and something that can be controlled and that's something that can take over the world. And, you know, in listening to all of you, it, it brought to mind that I think, you know, a lot of our characters, we are in a lot of our characters and I think our personal experiences are in our stories and uh, you know I've always been um, the one that asks questions well what about this and you know I want to look further and think bigger and nothing is ever good enough you know so you know when I started writing my stories that a lot of uh, especially Dragon Horse uh, it was uh, part of my experiences um, you know and everything that I went through and learning uh, about magic and I actually I mean I actually performed <clears throat> you know practiced and healing and, and all of that and um, so I'm just curious you know I like to uh, go into the meats and potatoes you know like odd and you know get into the dark stuff the forbidden stuff you know the stuff <laughs> that we're not supposed to know about you know and so when I write it I kind of sneak it in and it's almost like um, kind of a teachable moment you know I, I'm, I'm it's like I'm I have a message you know, when I'm writing so I'm just kind of curious if any of you when you're writing I mean in the back of your minds are you uh, do you have an underlying message that maybe uh you're trying to you know plant a seed to your readers or you know was it just something about you you just had to write it you just had to get it out of your head and write it tough question <laughs> all right I don't know if we're still taking turns because if we're taking turns I should go but if anybody's yes, just go ahead, in, I don't want to like be the first next <laughs> Okay, so I guess without sounding like I have like, you know, like feeding people propaganda or trying to like jump into their mind and mind assassinate them with my message, <laughs> I feel like in my books, I want them to be lighthearted and full of hope. So that's kind of like the message that I want to portray to my readers through my books. But um, I guess that's always in the back of my mind as the story progresses. But it's not like one of the key elements where I'm like hammering this in, like, oh, you should feel hope at when you read my book. Because I feel like my readers will catch on to that and they'll be like, all right, already. Hey, we get it. Like, I love J.K. Rowling, so don't assassinate me for this one in <laughs> Harry Potter, but I just read the Harry Potter series. And like, there are some times when she was writing, I'm like, okay, we get it. His scar burns. His scar hurts. It hurts so much. I just feel like she just like harped on it so much. I'm like, okay, we get it. I try not to do that, like, with my message. But yes, and I love Harry Potter. I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I'm, um, I also am very allergic to any kind of book that, that preaches or tries to forcibly get a message across. But when I look back at my own uh, story, um, and I tend to be just analytical. I ha can't help but analyze it myself. <laughs> and I think that the things that come out of my philosophy with whether or not I wanted to put them in there or not, the things that come out strongly in the stories are, it's a bit more intense than what you're saying, Jonathan. It's more like desperate <laughs> hope. It's much darker. It's not a lighthearted story. And uh, it can be, there have been people who have said it's too intense. Uh, it's a story with a lot of emotional impact. And the people who like it are the people who like really emotionally. Um, gripping and sometimes even wrenching stories and uh part of what comes out of it is doesn't you know no matter how bad things get hope is about how you put one foot in front of the other as long as you're alive you keep doing it um even even if you've lost other people or um 
there are other things that are so dark that you don't know how to handle it. Um, it there, the other part of it is about probably my experiences, again, uh, traveling around to lots of different places, interviewing many different people, and often the people who had the most sense of freedom in inside themselves were in outsiders of some kind in their society or in their group. And so the story has a lot to do with outsiders and a lot to do with inner freedom. There's an aspect of uh, a, a power cult that uses not exactly mind control, but control of emotions and wills. And the people who um, are outsiders, it's, it's, a, it's a price you pay to have um, a measure of inner freedom to some extent. And so the message that I see in there, even though it's not stated in any way in terms of bringing it into the real world is um, it's not always a bad thing to be an outsider. <laughs> and uh, there may be some benefits to it as well as some difficulties. Okay. Next, <laughs> next one. <laughs> I feel like um, <laughs> with, um, with my story, there's, there's definitely a idea of, power and and i've said this before but but really the main theme would be this idea that power is it, it's not a bad thing but it can potentially be and so there's definitely this for the whole arc for the series this idea of being cautious with power um and making sure that you you balance it with your own personal um ideals and not just use it without forethought um, and, and there's sub, there's sub, uh, for each ser uh, story in the series, there are sort of these sub ideas where like in the first one, there's definitely a be careful what you wish for idea. Um, because Jacqueline, my main character is very, is, is she's a fangirl, which comes from, you know, another fangirl, this girl, um, who loves reading these sort of books and loves seeing this adventure um, unfold in front of her. And so she jumps in headfirst to this whole idea of being a hero. And, and there are heroes can be, you know, being, having a heroic journey can be a harrowing experience, but she doesn't accept that at first. She really wants to find the best in it and go in there and just, you know, trample through all the bad guys. And it's just not how it works. And it takes some time for her to grasp that. So I feel like she gets a little bit beaten up in the course of the story but in ways that I feel like change her character in a positive manner. So it's, it's not a message that I'm, I'm, you know, throwing hard balls with either, but I feel like it's definitely something that I'd like to get across, this idea that, that you know, you should, and anything, any dream that you have is a double-edged thing if, you're, if you don't handle it properly. So I didn't go into my story to create a message, but a lot of my characters are searching for a home, whether it be a physical home or just some place where they feel like they belong. So for instance, my for the first book in my series, The Shield, this character, Shade, she's a half-free, she's a half-human, half-something else. And her people, they treat her terribly and they bully her throughout her entire life. So she's never had this place where she fit in. And then in my second book, the characters, they, the characters, they have that same problem where they know they're different. And they, they just feel like they're different and they just don't know where they fit in. So a lot of my stories is about just having, the, having these characters who are sort of, they don't actually know where they belong and they're trying to figure that out. Did you say your character was half human and half something else? What's the other half? <laughs> So uh, my care, my along with creating my own magic system, I created my own race of beings called the Shield, and they they they're the type of people that pull energy from darkness and store it inside themselves. So that's her other half. The other half is sort of this being that can pull energy from darkness, and her other half is human. That's cool. That's a really good idea. <laughs> and do they look like humans? No. Sorry. Do the shields? If I heard that correctly, look like humans? Yes, they look like humans, but they have sort of odd features. So they have, they can have colored hair or different colored eyes, but on the surface there, they look human. They just have like maybe blue hair or green eyes or something. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's really interesting when you're talking about your characters. Um, I like to surf the web all the time, and I'm always looking for, you know, I, I'm into the star seed stuff, and so candlelight cobwebs, you know, I have, a sh- I have shifters in there, and they kind of sneak in the story, and I learned about the avian society and in the book i go back to a lot of the secret societies that are in our world you know in the past and in the present and i stumbled across the avian society which if you really get into the beginnings of our earth you know the animals came first and the animals each animal came from a different planet and then the ETs came and they decided to mess around and so the next thing you know you got them messing with the the lions and the panthers and you get these cat people and uh, so I thought oh, that would be a great idea for a shifter so in Caroline cobwebs it's actually I do have these panther shifters um, so I'm just kind of curious for you guys uh, you know what what inspires you where do you find your ideas you know, do you have to do something special? Do you find an idea by uh, turning the TV on and, and, and this certain show comes on and it triggers something? Or really, where do you guys get your ideas? You know, I want to know what's going on in your heads. <laughs> and well, we That's know a dangerous not. question. What's going on in our heads? There's a lot of madness that's going on even right now. Yeah. But yeah, to answer your question, I feel like I could get inspiration from like books, TV shows, movies, even music. And usually when I get inspiration, it may not be like a whole idea for a book, but at least like a scene. Like, oh, that would be like a really strong scene or like something to incorporate into my story. And then um, it's interesting that you said when you were doing research for like shifters and stuff like that. How when I write a book, for me at least, and everybody has a different process, but for me, I try to do as little as research as I need to because for me, I feel like if I read something, I'm going to be like, oh, that's the way it has to be. And I feel like my creativity kind of like leeches off the more I read and know about something because then I'm not using my own ideas. I'm kind of like, like, okay, well, this happens and this happens and stuff like that. So I do like a very, very minimal research, but I, I think I am that's not the norm. I think for most authors, most authors actually go in and try to find out as much as possible. I think I'm actually pretty similar to you. I do have a tendency to, um, to stay away from research unless it's some, I'm delving into something specific. Um, so if in the course of plotting out the story, I come across something that really, I just can't, you know, I, I, it's not something that I would make up. It's something I really genuinely need to know the, the, all the information behind I'll dig in. But other than that, I, I tend to try to work the whole thing out without any research um, because I'm creating, some, I, at least in, in my situation for, for my type of book, I'm creating something that is, it really has no basis in, in mythology. It's mostly a, a something that's coming, you know, largely out of my head. I mean, there's a lot of parallels to other mythology, but this particular class system that's going on is not something you know, it's something that exists more in contemporary reality than anything. So, um, so we definitely try to to draw from that um, more than I draw from from other sources. But I feel like when it comes to what triggers the ideas, um, there are. It's definitely like I could pick a lyric out of a song. Um, every now and then I'll hear something and it just, that's, that creates the scene in my head. A lot of times I'll be thinking through, um, the course of a story and trying to pluck something, you know, trying to get something, um, some kind of inspiration. And I'll just be listening to music on the subway and, and not even really writing. Um, and then there it comes, the scene from a lyric in a song or, a line in a book or you know I'll, I'll have an idea for the the book as a whole but not the inspiration for that moment mm-hmm. and that will come from other like other things will just trigger that in me yeah i i can understand those specific things when it comes to a specific issue the series that i've written so far um and i'm coming close to the end of the sixth book that general idea i 
came up with back when I was a teenager, and it's developed over 20 years um, in terms of how it works, that there's a mind control cult, you know, kind of controlling the world <laughs> and things like that. It's, um, and, uh, but when it comes to specific scenes, I often, I find that I'm inspired by something that is really emotionally powerful. And oftentimes I will take something that happened in real life and look at the other side of it, um, turn it, turn it around so that it's different from what it, what it is in our reality. Um, so there's a guy who goes into a school with a gun, but he's not actually a bad guy, <laughs> you know, for instance, in one, in, in one part of it. Um, but it's, I, I, I don't always know everything that creeps into the story from my way of thinking. One of my friends who read my books in the beginning, um, and most of my friends liked it, and I don't know if this friend liked it, but he said, it's a really interesting walk through your mind, Ari. <laughs> I don't know if that was a good comment or not, but it was, you know, apparently he thought there was a lot of things in, in there that come from something in my mind. And, um, I tend to find that things come up almost subconsciously. And then I'll, I'll look back and say, oh, I must have gotten that from a song I was listening to. But it's not always a conscious process. In, in the creative process, I'll, I'll be writing a scene and I'm somewhat of a pantser. I, I will sort of plan a couple of chapters ahead and have a vague idea of how the story is gonna turn out. But when I sit down to write a scene, I pretty much purposefully don't plan out every single detail because it goes better if I'm riding the wave and then I'll go back and look and, and be surprised at what what came up and obviously I edit but <laughs> but uh, the the inspiration comes from things that are both conscious and subconscious well I sort of write what I take in so I really love horror post-apocalyptic apocalyptic or like the Sophian society so I'm inhale that in TV shows and books and it always comes up in my book. So my books will always have some sort of apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic theme in it. And also I'm a total nerd and I love anime with Japanese cartoons and it all that always finds its way into my story with the way my characters interact with their powers. It even even with the way my characters look. And I have some people who say my book reads like anime, but that's that's, that's kind of the point because I love anime and it sort of finds its way into my stories. <laughs> it's wonderful how you can put things, little things in details of the story sometimes that you just love. I have my characters play a card game that I love just because I needed a card game. <laughs> I can pick which one. <laughs> that's one thing I love. You can't always choose um, it's like things where it doesn't work if you do, but there are times when with little details you can really um, have your way for once. So wait a minute, does listening to music and reading books and watching TV shows count as work for us then? Can we count that as work? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> well, but for, for me it's not just watching TV shows or, or reading books, it's also just uh, sitting down at the block party and watching the neighbors and how they're interacting mm -hmm. and um, and observing um, human communication in, in a different light. It's very hard to get bored watching other people talk. Yeah, for me, it's a slippery slope because I feel like I can, I can justify myself in and out of a lot of stuff. So it's like, oh, I'm watching The Walking Dead, but this is giving me ideas for my book, so let's just binge this. <laughs> <clears throat> It's all, it, it, you know what, we're all, we're all looking for ideas mm. and we're all looking for inspiration. You can find it in anything. So you can kind of excuse everything as being like a writing, you know, this is for my writing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I got an idea once from um, a graffiti on, when I was on a train. When I was riding the train, there was this really cool graffiti and the name was interesting. So I decided to put in the story. That's cool. People watching on the subway is a good one too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when I have a when I have a writing block, I have a sauna inside my walk-in closet, and uh, I'll go in there and turn on uh, Lorena McKenna and listen to her, and you know the hot the hot sauna is just all of a sudden I got my next chapter. It's just so weird. <laughs> 
So Did you, you know, have a also, sauna in your closet. Yes. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Am I the only one that heard that? <laughs> like moving on how do you have a son where do you live <laughs> so you have a son in your oh um, i live uh, <laughs> i live in the mountains in colorado oh, <laughs> oh okay <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I feel like and i don't know if this is true for any of you but a lot of my ideas like a lot of things will be inspired in me by doing something but a lot of the times when i'm you know washing dishes all of a sudden, they'll be like, oh, there's that scene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it comes from just, just doing something that's idle that you don't even think about. Mm -hmm. um, and it just it triggers something. And, and by the end of the, the dish doing, I've, I've plotted out a lot of dialogue and maybe maybe a little bit have talked to myself. <laughs> I'm plotting mm -hmm. out that dialogue. Uh, oh, that I do more than talk to myself. <laughs> I act out scenes in the middle of the living room. <laughs> yeah, that, okay. Okay. <laughs> The other people in the house will look at me strange, but <laughs> I've, I've been known to. Yeah, that's why when I get writer's block, I usually just take a step back and do something else because it just, uh, whatever I'm stuck on, it just sort of comes to me when I'm doing something else. And I always have to have like a journal or my um, note app around because it just comes to me when I'm not really expecting it. I heard that your subconscious works on problems for you. Like, so if you get stuck on something, if you go to sleep or do something else, like what you guys are saying, your subconscious keeps on working that idea and then it'll uh, pop up. Stephen King calls his subconscious the boys in the basement. So he says when he's having a hard time where he gets stuck, he just gives it to the boys in the basement. He goes like to bed or something like that. And then they come up with answers for him. Yeah, it's like a, a, a puzzle where it's as if your subconscious puts different puzzle pieces together. So while it might be a song you listen to and some graffiti you saw on the train and the way that your neighbor looked at the other neighbor at the party last week, but you wouldn't be able to consciously put these things together, but your subconscious can somehow fit those pieces together often and come up with things that are um, more interesting and uh, work better in the plot from my experience. You know, I, I learned to trust the process, and I think a lot of what I do, I, I'm probably the only weirdo in the group here today, but but I call it I channeling. I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> I like to call it channeling because it's so weird. I'll be just gone and writing, and then I'll go back later and read and go, who wrote that? That wasn't me. But, you know, not that it was bad, but it was like, uh, those are not my words. Those are better than what I would come up with. So it's like, so a lot of times if I just let it go, I, I just, I feel like I'm channeling, you know, maybe channeling me, myself and I, you know, like Stephen King, the boys in the basement. I don't know, but <laughs> it's weird. I would view that more as turning off your internal editor. Um, <laughs> where you're not stopping yourself anymore. Right. Yeah, the editor gets to come on. The editor gets to come on when you do the second draft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it sounds like we got a, a pregnant pause going here. You know, um, when I wrote, when I, I think one of the main reasons I started writing uh, Dragon Horse was I got, I got so tired of watching the, the negative Hollywood, you know, everything's so negative about witches. And because I studied earth-based religion, it was like, you know, I, I kind of want to balance the scale a little bit and, and t you know, write about witches that really aren't that bad. Uh, yeah, you got good and bad and everything, of course. But, I mean, there's some good witches out there, too. And, you know, so I think that's one of the – another reason why – uh, I decided to write, you know, the way I wrote is just kind of change, uh, you know, what's been put out there. Um, I don't know what anybody else's, uh, you know, thinks about that, but I just had to throw that in. Well, that's how I approached my first book, because I was a bit tired of seeing these sort of horror movies where these there's this monster that's chasing after these really stupid kids. So I decided that I would run a, want to write something from sort of the monster's point of view. And that they're not really monsters, it's just that they sort of, that other people see them as monsters, but they have feelings and 
you know, they have their own darkness that, that they deal with and that they actually have someone that they really care about. So it's sort of taking this idea of the monster and turning it around to make them, you know, the good guys. <clears throat> Yeah, it's kind of yeah. Like, there's a lot of. Uh, oops. <laughs> go ahead, okay. go ahead, Ari. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not necessarily um, trying to turn around to show the the monsters from a horror movie. It's it's similar in that I'm turning a lot of things around into ways that we don't necessarily think of, and uh, characters often are stuck between situations that force them to do things we wouldn't normally think had a good reason, but because you get yourself into the mindset of the characters who live in our reality, as if they live in our reality, and yet they're dealing with a background of um, a much darker and scarier world than we realize today exists, therefore they'll do things that we would think were um, bad or off the wall and yet the reader I've never had a reader say that they didn't understand this except two readers who started the fourth book without reading the first three they did not understand this because they were not in the mindset of the um, of the world but the people who had read it before were discussing with them and saying, no this is completely reasonable because this is this is this is this <laughs> you know and if you get into the the mindset of that magical system which works as a whole and has its internal consistency then you understand where these characters are coming from and their actions seem completely understandable even though if you were looking at them from the outside you would say they were bad yeah and i think you touched on consistency right now when you were talking and that's like a huge key because i feel like especially if you have a series of books it's really easy as you're writing book four to forget what happened in book one or how you describe something in book one. So you guys can't see it, but I have like five huge dry erase boards I nailed to my wall in my office. And I just have like, just like, it looks like I'm a serial killer or trying to hunt for a serial killer, like pictures and yarn connecting dots and ideas and like pretty nuts. But yeah, that's one of the things that I definitely had to, uh, learn is that I needed to write down everything, like every little thing so I could stay consistent throughout the whole story. One thing that I feel that I did as far as consistency that might be considered a little bit crazy is that I know pretty much every major thing that happens in all six books before I started writing book one, um, mostly because I really did want to make sure that I didn't surprise myself and write myself into a corner where something didn't make sense. And even now, I still have moments where I'm, you know, as I'm working on book two or I'm sort of scrambling out of a... It's a moment of, oh, wait, we, you know, I decided to change this part and then did not uh, think of how I was going to do the rest of this. Um, so even even with the, the crazy planning, um, I haven't really crazily planned as much as I wanted to. But I definitely know um, the main character arcs for um, all six books. And so in that way, I, and I have, I keep sort of like a, a series, I guess, Bible, if you will, a, a document that all the main points are there so that I don't forget it as I go forward and I add to it as I change things and, and it, to keep up the consistency because the last thing you want, I've read, I read a book series um, and I'm not going to name names here because it makes it sound bad, but <laughs> because it's a really good book series. So I don't want to do that. But there are book series where characters started out looking or behaving in one way and my magic systems end, ended up changing by book three. And <laughs> And you, you, you know, you don't want that. You don't want your reader, it pulls the reader out of the story. You don't want the reader to look back and go, wait, but in, in book one, they couldn't do that. Um, so you have to be really cautious about keeping up um, everything you've set up in book one and being able to carry that until, and not make any huge changes on what people can do or who people are, unless there are character development changes that happen because of story. Well, also they can discover new things about the magical system because- sure. In my story, the characters, even the most adept, actually don't know very much because most, almost all the knowledge was lost back in about 700 uh, AD. And uh, they, 
therefore they're learning by baby steps basically and so there are a lot of things that come up later on but i had to know about them in the beginning and and there's a lot of things i probably am not nearly as much of a planner in terms of knowing every single major event but basically i set the framework and then i just have to stick to that framework period there the, 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 if it's hard to get out of a certain corner i just have to find a way that is in in um that is consistent with the framework that i already set up and one of the ways that I do it is I, um, I, whenever I'm doing something mindless, I'm often listening to um, a text to speech thing, re reading back to me um, at fairly quickly, other passages that I wrote earlier in earlier books so that I'm reminding myself constantly, having the voices of the characters, the way that they sounded way back then, not just a description of the characters in, a, in the files that I have, but also listening to the, the voices of the characters, again, coming through those words so that I'm keeping the character's voice consistent over six books, which is another whole can of worms. <laughs> well, I'm the same as Jonathan. I have um, boards on my wall with just tons of notes about world building, and I have this giant map that I drew just to keep track of where everything is in my world. And then I have, um, Teach, like cheat sheets where I listed all my characters and their powers and then I listed all the characters, their personalities and their soul wounds, the sad moments in their life that really changed them. And then I also have like pictures of knives on my wall with someone co yeah. commented on and or pictures of really creepy, uh, really creepy characters because for some reason I have issues keeping track of the animals in my story so I had to print it out and put it up on my wall. And I um, also have like pictures of houses. So it's just a ton of like notes on my wall that just helps me to remember things on my, in my stories. Yeah, you know, I don't know if any of you, but I wrote my books backwards. I started with Dragon Horse and then uh, it was like, well, I can't go forward. So now I have to go backwards. So yeah, it, it gets really difficult keeping everything straight. And I have, piles and piles and piles and stacks of notes and notebooks and but it's really funny because when I go back and dig through those notes I end up changing it anyways <laughs> so but okay uh, we have a few minutes left here so let, do we want to address how people can mess up their magical system maybe real quickly everybody can go around and, and address that Yeah, sure. I think just um, for, for, no, pretty much like the opposite of what we were just talking about before. Like, if you have characters, my characters, the magic kind of resol re resolves around more like superpowers for them. So, like, they're each given a gift as Nephilim to do different abilities. So, I guess it'd be really easy to continue down the storyline and then maybe just like do skips. I've read authors who don't explain like transitions very well. So, all of a sudden, you know, they're superheroes like learning. But then there's no like rocky workout scene where he gets better all of a sudden, you know, and then all of a sudden they're just like super powered. And you're like, what? How did this happen? This isn't right. <laughs> I'd say another issue is when, um, when you don't put limits on the magic, mm -hmm. there, there's nothing stopping a character from doing whatever they want pretty much. And yet they don't take over the world or they don't, um, become wealthy. In fact, sometimes they're kind of poor, but yet they could make all this stuff if they wanted to. Um, and then very unexpected magic can come up because the author doesn't want to necessarily limit it. But if you don't limit it, you don't actually end up with a believable system. And it also can tend to take over the story and the plot. Um, the story should still be about the people and the emotions because that's where the major tension actually will come up. Um, Fantasy is great to have the magic in there because it, it expands our horizons and, and makes us think about the story as well as just have an adventure. But it, it still has to, the core of it has to be characters and emotion. Yeah, I, mean, I was thinking something similar to you as far as like, as limiting powers, because I feel like what happens is when you, when you make a character too powerful, mm -hmm. it can get out of anything. 
<laughs> and it just ruins it ruins all the tension in the story and and you, you kind of okay well they'll just come back or they'll find a way out and you you kind of always have that idea where you know in the end they'll they'll do sex machina and just you know do a crazy magic spell and poof, everything's saved and it, it just it takes away every bit of tension in a story one of um one of the stories that I can think of where, where characters have been overpowered, um, if anybody ever watched Heroes, um, Silo, the villain, was just, he was so overpowered, they couldn't even really beat him. I mean, there was, <laughs> there, they would do, they would go through all these crazy hoops to beat him, but in the end, you kind of knew he was going to fly away and be fine, and it just ruined any kind of, of permanent um, consequences for, for the actions of the characters. So really, I think overpowering characters or, or, you know, or like you said, where people can just do anything and there's no limits, that's a huge problem. Oh, and also using magic to solve every problem. So a character gets into some sort of trouble and author is just, okay, the, I'll give them this ability and they'll get out of the trouble. And then they'll sort of forget that they gave this character the ability and it's like they aren't thinking about what this ability will do to the rest of the story or the rest of the series. We have to keep thinking about just not, just not what the effect is at that moment, but what it's going to be down the line. That's true. I feel like a lot of times authors create easy buttons, kind of like easy buttons for their characters to get out of certain situations. But then they'll come up against like a situation they could have used that easy button, but the author wants to move the story along a different way. So you're thinking like, oh, why didn't they just like do that before? Hermione Granger, reach into your bag and, you know, pull something out that you need right now. But also you don't want characters to be solving their major problems with magic, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you want your character to have magic and to do some magic, but when it comes right down to the main crux of the plot, can't center around the character just does some, gets into the really big plot situation, the biggest conflict comes up and they solve it by magic. Even if the, even if the ability was already previously known, it should require courage, um, moral fortitude, uh, <laughs> great <Your> brain. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They have to use that magic. You know, they've got to they've got to have something that they have to overcome to use the magic, or something like that, in order to make it interesting. Because if it's just that they ha you you have to remember that they have the right gift to you know get rid of the big dragon at the end of the story, <laughs> then it's not going to have the tension, and it's not going to be memorable enough. You know, you know, your reader might be sort of satisfied, but probably not satisfied enough to tell all their friends. Yeah, magic is a tool. It's something that the character uses and they have to use their mind or their intellect or their their experience and apply that to whatever they're doing, apply it to their magic and sort of get that, use that to get them out of the situation. So it's not just casting a spell and magically everything works. The character has to use their mind to figure out how magic can fix this situation or how they can fix this situation without magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's having a cool. character fix everything with magic would be the equivalent of writing a um, a programmer, you know, thriller about computer programmers, and just okay. So at the end, they were all in this trap, and then he just did some programming, and it was gone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. Well, what I had, what I did with my character was I used magic as a way of character development. And uh, it, 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 it helped her grow and she had to, she had to learn, you know, she had to go through all the steps uh, to learn how to use this magic correctly. But uh, that just takes us, guys. It looks like our time just flew. And um, I guess we have to wrap this session up. And uh, it was a lot of fun and informative. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank all you to, for coming and uh, speaking with the, everybody that's uh, joining the Virtual Fantasy Con. And uh, we hope uh, everybody that listens checks out everybody's books. A lot of got to have some great authors here. And uh, so thank you all for joining us. And we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>